Okay, Christy. Um, I can't wait to introduce you to Christy. She's, a, as I said, a really popular writer and she's got experience in primary and secondary teaching, early childhood education, psychology, and as a woman diagnosed at 33 years old, and she's also a parent of autistic children, she's going to have some really good insights for you today. So please join me in welcoming Christy. I just want to announce that I'm really anxious because that will make me feel better about being anxious. <laughs> so thank you for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about internalising and hidden anxiety because I think we have this idea that anxiety is something that's really obvious when you look at a person, but you can actually see a person like me and I'm often told I come across as really confident but inside I'm a little bit like don't hurt me. Okay. So we've already talked about this. This is just my background. I am the mum of four autistic daughters, ranging from four years old to 21 years old. And this is my beautiful family. We are all autistic in my family and we're all happy and thriving. And we embrace autism as an identity and a culture. We don't view it as a disorder. So it works really well for us. So I want to talk a little bit about masking to begin. So this is something that's commonly spoken about in the autistic community. And masking is when we make attempts to fit in with people. And what that means is that I would be suppressing parts of my normal autistic self. So I didn't know I was autistic until I was 33 and I don't think that really made a difference to be honest about whether I masked or not. I think that everybody masks to some degree but as I got older masking became something that I put a lot of time and energy into. So I would analyse the way people moved their heads when they spoke, their facial expressions, clothes they wore, things they would say in social groups and I'd really pay close attention to the people that were received really well by others. So if they were popular, I'd make them my, secretly, my mentor. So I would take pieces of other people and I'd create my own persona from those bits and pieces that I studied. I just want to start by saying I am a child fashion victim of the 80s. So when you see my haircuts, just blame my mum. So this is me and my mum on my fifth birthday. I started school when I was five and I still remember the first day of school. Mum was taking a photo and I was sobbing and sobbing and sobbing. I had my school uniform on and my backpack on and she was trying to get me really excited but I was so anxious about leaving my safety net and going somewhere that was just completely foreign to me. I think my greatest memories of prep were the carpet, the tabletop, the concrete, because my body would physically freeze. I couldn't speak, I couldn't get my words out, I couldn't think. I did not know what was going on around me because the anxiety would freeze me to the point where everything outside in my peripheral vision would be black. So I could hear something like I was underwater and nothing could bring me out of that. Asking for help was not something that I would do because it would make me vulnerable, it would make me seen and heard and that didn't feel safe for me as a child. My teacher really had no clue whether I was intelligent or not because I couldn't express that because I wouldn't engage in schoolwork because it meant having to move my body, having to look up from the ground, having to walk across the room and I just couldn't bring myself to do those things. So I want to talk about something that I've always been severely impacted by. I know we talk a lot about 
um, sensory integration and sensory input. I'm a person with sensory processing disorder, so I don't receive sensory input the same way that other people do. And I can feel absolutely bombarded by it. And I didn't know that until a few years ago. So I just, I've been surviving it basically. But something we don't talk about enough is the input from the energies of other people. So I'm a very sensitive person around other people. Even when I'm comfortable, the presence that a person brings around me is something that I take on. And I know that this has been called being empathic at times, and people might think, oh, it sounds like a woo-woo anti-science idea, but I want to talk about this because it's very, very real for me. If there's an angry person in a room, whether I know them or not, I internalise their anger and I feel responsible for it. And as a child, this was absolutely debilitating. I would blame myself for other people's emotional experiences and states of being. And even when a person was experiencing joy and happiness and they were around me, that energy from their happiness felt chaotic and unstable and scary. And it felt like a threat to my safety and my immediate environment. So in a classroom full of five-year-old children, that was a very real and scary thing. Again, mullet haircut, <laughs> cut by my mother, and I was sure to tell the teachers that too. Um, so we moved on from my original school, and we moved town, and our extended family lived there, and my auntie was a secretary at the new school. So that made a huge difference for me because I saw a familiar face and I was able to relax more into who I was. At the other school I ended up running away every day and hiding behind a building and nobody knew. My teacher didn't even notice that I wasn't in the classroom for days on end. I'd get dropped off, I'd hide behind a building and when I knew that parents were turning up I'd come back around and it was never questioned, it was never talked about, not even sure if my mum knows. <laughs> so when we moved schools, I relaxed a bit, but I became really aware of my difference. And I became aware because I'd listened to conversations that my peers were having, and I felt that I was much older and more insightful. And it's not an ego-based thing, it's just that I knew I thought differently about people and serious issues and I was really interested in what was going on in the world and my peers weren't like that. So that was a very isolating experience. Comprehension and understanding for me was difficult because again, the energy of all my classmates constantly surrounding me and even when I was comfortable, I was so distracted by what everybody else was doing that I had no idea what the teacher was talking about, what they were asking us to do. So I'd wing it, I'd do a bit of work, and I had strategies that I would use so the teachers would never check on my work or never come over and ask me what I was up to because I knew how to blend in in such a way that I could get away with not knowing what was going on. My executive functioning, oh gosh. Yeah, it was a problem, seriously. I, again, I couldn't, I mean, when you're coupling not being able to manage time or remember to pack things into your bag, and I was raised in a family where independence was strongly encouraged, and I failed at it all the time because I just couldn't remember anything but then when I did, and when I did engage in schoolwork, I was so focused on what I was doing, I would panic about the time restraints on how long I had to get an activity done. So if I had something to do and I was told, you've got 10 minutes to do it, major anxiety for me because I like to put everything I have into what I'm doing. And being interrupted from that or having a teacher say, okay, time to move on to the next thing, was like ripping my arms off. 
I'd be so devastated that I could not complete the task. That's me as a teenager, standing on the table, if you don't hardly mind. <laughs> Going into year seven, I thought, this is a brand new start. I have an opportunity here to be a completely different person. There'll be new people, lots of people that don't know me, and I can recreate who I am. I could even be popular. So I tried to look really cool. I did look really cool. Well, I think I did. But the problem with what I was observing was students that were considered unruly, misbehaved, and that's what happened for me. So I became a student that was constantly put in isolation, on conduct cards, on behavioural modification programs. My parents were constantly called into the school. So I went from one extreme to another. And the thing about being that child or that teenager was that it provided me a sense of protection. Other kids wouldn't bully me because they were frightened of me. Everybody thought I was a bit cool because I said what I thought and I did what I wanted. Um, so it was like a form of survival for me, being that child. Underneath all of that, I was suffering, absolutely suffering. I had an eating disorder, I had hormonal imbalances, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, so I was out of my mind for three weeks of the month. I had other health issues and comorbidities that weren't being seen to because I wouldn't ask for help. I was constantly burnt out and exhausted from being somebody that I wasn't. And in the end, I'd only show up for school a couple of days a week. My mum worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day, so she didn't know. And I ended up having weeks on end off school and nobody would call, nobody would ask where I was. I don't think I was very missed. The sad part about all of this was that the focus was on my behaviour. Nobody actually looked beyond my behaviour and questioned why I would go from being a child who couldn't speak to being somebody who was so poorly behaved. I didn't have anybody ask me why, what was going on, was there any way they could help me. I was just reprimanded and punished and corrected and it didn't help at all. It just really reaffirmed my need to behave that way. I was sent off to boarding school for six months um, and it behaved my, it improved my academic performance and my behaviour, but I couldn't cope outside my home environment, so I came home. I ended up leaving school at 15 and not completing my secondary education. I failed all the way through school. When I came out of school, masking had gifted me with poor mental health outcomes. I had an absolute identity crisis because I had no idea who I was or why I was different or why I felt the need to be someone I wasn't. It interrupted the development of who I'm supposed to be. So I knew the whole time, I knew I was intelligent. I knew that I had these amazing strengths, <coughs> but it was never safe to talk about them or have anybody see them. And I didn't want anybody to have expectations of me because I was afraid I wouldn't be able to rise to them. I couldn't connect with people authentically, so all of my friendships were really fake because they were in a relationship with someone who they thought I was, but I wasn't that person. So I didn't have any connections with people that I really valued. And I constantly lived with the fear of being caught out or somebody uncovering who I really was. And I just assumed that that was really bad. Whoever I was was really bad. So here's the truth about how my brain works and what I needed. My cognitive processing, my autism, my mind, my brain requires time, patience, space, freedom. It requires people to respect my difference 
and to look beyond what they see as a physical expression of an internalised process. When I have these things, the allowance for analysis and processing, those are very, very important to me, time to analyse and process. When I have these things, my work results with more accuracy and precision. I have more thorough and expert level understandings of academic work and I can find problems and solve them. I can really find problems in other people's work. <laughs> Here's how my mind works with my body. And this is common for autistic people, but I can only speak for myself. My mind is slow to process. My body works immediately. So when there's a threat, which is a form of anything that means I'll be anxious, my body kicks into fight, flight or freeze instantly. My mind's got no idea what's going on. Like now there's no threat, but my body, my heart's racing, I'm sweating, I'm shaking, you can hear my voice is trembling. And with some autistic people, particularly non-speaking autistic people with significant support needs, they often write about the fact that their body won't follow the intention of their mind. There's a greater disconnect there, particularly when there's sensory input and it's very distracting and disconnecting. Some of my triggers are anything new and unfamiliar, anything that involves unfamiliar people or a lot of people, a feeling that my control has been compromised, so any of my freedom, choice or supports, if they're compromised or taken away, I feel hugely anxious. Again, expectations and demands I may not be able to rise to. Pressure, criticism, being wrong, still working on that one. <laughs> Vulnerability, being seen, heard and noticed, and not being seen, heard and noticed. These are the ways in which my anxiety manifests, which I've just spoken about. It can also include gut pain and issues, digestion disruptions, um, spending a lot of time on the loo, stimming, overeating or not eating at all. And in my later teen years, drugs and alcohol became a very sad reality for me. This is what would have helped me in a classroom or in an educational environment. Being validated. Exploration of my experience as a young person, my feelings, my thoughts, asking me questions to help me explore why I behaved in certain ways. Because it would bring calm, relief, it would normalise my experience had I known I was autistic, but unfortunately I didn't. Regulation, sensory input or avoidance, these are so important for autistic people. Stimming, rest. I always encourage families to really be realistic about how much our children can take on in a week. I know school requires five days in a row of attendance, but sometimes this is too much and it leads to trauma, exhaustion and burnout. And we have to be real in supporting our children. I allow my girls to have regular breaks from school. They don't need to give me a reason. They just need to let me know that they can't do it today. And I listen, it's really important to listen. Again, space, time and freedom. Allowance for the time it takes for me to calm down. Space for me to calm down. Um, and again, freedom in processing. So that might mean that my girls, when they're anxious, will ask me questions that might seem redundant over and over and over. So they might say, what day is it? Mum, what date is it today? Ah, so what time are we leaving? And they'll ask the same questions over and over. What they're doing is seeking connection because they're anxious. So if I'm busy and they can't have a lot of connection with me in that moment, asking a question grabs my attention, stops me, makes me engage with them and provides them a level of comfort. Some people use meditation, grounding activities to reconnect my mind with my body. 
and positive self-talk and love and gratitude messaging for my body. So I will communicate with my body and say, thank you, anxiety, I understand what your purpose is, everything is okay. Sometimes this is effective, sometimes it's not. Acceptance is crucial. Current strategies that autistic people use at school should be encouraged and scaffolding, building on the strategies and using the child's strengths to do that and always listening. Respect for neurological differences, being gentle and I think sometimes we have to also again be realistic about how much a child can perform, what they can rise to. This doesn't mean that it's lifelong, but we might need to revisit goals that we've set that are causing anxiety or might make a child feel like they're under some form of pressure. And it's not failing. It's not about failing. It's about allowing them to develop and to learn at their own rate. And these are some other ways that um, I could have been supported at school. Connection, oh my God, I cannot emphasize this enough. In high school, I did have one teacher, the music teacher, of course, always the music or the art teacher. Um, and I suspect, you know, similarities in neurology there. Very accepting, very loving, no expectations, just happy for me to show up excited about me being there, encouraging me to just be there and that made me want to be there because there was no pressure or expectation and eventually I would engage with the work. More choice takes away my anxiety. Having a positive autistic identity is crucial. My four-year-old has never been raised with anything other than that. She goes to kinder, she asks for what she needs and she has no shame around it. She doesn't know that anybody would have a negative view of what autism is because as a family, it's our normal and we put our hand up and we ask for what we want and she's thriving in that environment because she embraces her autism. Um, in the classroom, not singling children out. So have you double checked your routine on your desk there, taped to the desk for everybody to see. Probably one of the worst things that I saw happen to other students in the classroom because they'd be bullied outside of the classroom then. Um, rest, like I said, validation and respect. Time, space, autonomy, respect for learning styles and neurotype. So I'm now on my third university degree with supports. I had no idea that I was uh, that I had a high IQ until I was diagnosed as autistic, which is just so interesting. Um, but with supports, I've been able to have success academically because I've been accepted for the way my brain works and supported with that. Using music and headphones in a classroom. When I was a teacher, this was such a big no-no, and I just let the kids do it anyway because I built my classrooms to be the kind of supportive environment that I would have thrived in. I never had problems with my students. I had great relationships with them and their families and they thrived. Music in headphones for me blocks off the distractions, the energy from other people's and helps me to focus on what I'm doing. More input and control over my schoolwork. More say in how I do it. What are my areas of strength? How can I use those to work on projects? Am I terrified of public speaking? then please don't make me do it in front of my peers because again, you're making me a target. Homework. <laughs> I know this will probably make me really unpopular. So many children love homework. Children like me, it just felt so overwhelming. When I go home from school at the end of the day, that's my time to unpack, analyse, process the day's events and to come to terms with what everybody said, what they were wearing, how their hair was styled today. And I have no control over that because that's my autistic brain taking in my environment, making sense of it and letting it go. That takes the whole entire afternoon for me to do, unwinding. And that's the end.